talk today about bioelectric interfaces at the nanoscale. And it's a little scary to me, frankly, in some ways, because this is a challenge across many different disciplines and areas. And I've learned probably more in the last three or four years I've been doing this than I had any time prior. But in doing that, that means that I'm on an edge of some of the stuff I talk about. So I'm going to be representing mostly a lot of other people's work and a lot of work that's been going on in my lab with a lot of different students. And I hope I do that well and, and credit everybody. But I think this is a very interesting area. I started you know, like with the gently reshaping electrode, <laughs> the fine electrode for um, peripheral nerve stimulation. And we're being pretty successful in moving that forward in the clinic. But I think the challenge is, uh, as we go down 10 years down the road, what are we looking for? And so nanoscale is, is, the interesting, is an interesting area of, of future development. And what I want to do today, um, basically, is talk about what I view, or at least in the work that I do or, or work in, in my lab and the collaborators, what we call the nanoscale. Because I think that that term in general is used a lot for many different things, depending who you're talking to, what flooding agency they're going for at that time. So I'm just going to give you basically my view on the nanoscale. Um, I want to, I'll do this kind of in three parts. I want to motivate it first by what I think we can achieve in neural engineering and neural interfacing and what some of the special things are the uh, things that neural interfacing if FES, rehab engineering have maybe that's different than say a biomaterials or a polymer type person at the nanoscale. Um, and ultimately, I think that three things want to come across. So I'll talk about what I think it is. I'll talk about what we've been making progress in on the nanoscale in terms of substrates for uh, interfaces with the neurons and nervous system. And then I'm going to end this with, um, and since I, I was at NIH I gave, or for a talk on a workshop about the roadmap of, of nano funding, nano roadmap, whatever it is, nano medicine. Um, I'm going to end probably for a couple minutes talking about what I think the challenges are to get to the nano scale uh, in neural interfacing. It's not simply small stuff. There's a whole gamut of things that has to go with that to make it practical. So those are the three main things I want to talk about. And really, if you remember three, uh, remember one-ish thing from today, the, the things I hope to get across, is that really the bioelectric nanoscale is really, is, as I'm working on it here, is the proteins and really their interactions with the biotic and abiotic interface. I mean, the, real, uh, the way I view it is that our nervous system, most cells, in fact, work because of proteins, protein channels, proteins on the device, how proteins come to your device, interact, and what's going on, how they signal other cells, and those type of things. So it's kind of how we manipulate and work with proteins at that level is kind of the nanoscale part. There's many points with that. And then uh, the, the middle portion that we've been working on is mechanically dynamic nanocomposites. There's the nano part, but essentially how we, we build uh, materials that have properties based on their nanoscopic uh, characteristics. And that this mechanical dynamic material does, in fact, uh, appear to be uh, improve the response of neural tissue for the bioelectric interface. This is a material that we're working towards to basically become biomimetic, biointegrated. And I'll, I'll talk about those. I think it's important. And then the last thing I want to leave with, the last third of this or the last section, of it, is that the, the nanoscale, particularly in bioelectric interfaces, is going to require an extensive uh, multidisciplinary approach to really get to that level of interface. I think there's a lot of things that have to be developed across many different fields. And like I said, in the work I'm doing, or that we're doing in the lab, you'll see there's been a lot of, uh, a lot of different disciplines that have come together even to get to the starting point that we're at. And there's still quite a bit of work to go. So the goal of, of, in my mind, of the nano interface is to develop devices. And in reality, or where I think that my research I wanted to go in terms of um, to the future is developing devices that integrate with the neural system, not necessarily are put on and around and tolerated. And I think that's the step we're trying to go over. So right now, if you look at what we do clinically, I can put a device on a nerve that we're pretty confident is going to last for 20 years. But I know it's going to be encapsulated. I know the body is going to respond to it. But I know that's going to reach some steady state condition where the body is somewhat in stasis with the device. There's a happy medium. And ultimately, it's a point where I don't need to interact with individual cells. I have a device in there that if I'm encapsulated, it's OK, because I'm going to push current through it, and I'm going to get the type of level interface that I want. And I think moving to the nano scale, what I find interesting in that is to actually integrating with, so blurring, if you will, or looking how to make that the definition between biotic and abiotic blurry. Um, and so I think there's a few key pieces I'll hit on today is that um, to develop an interface that disappears into the native tissue, both biochemically and mechanically. I mean, essentially, we're a big bag of chemicals in a lot of ways, right? So how do we disappear into the chemically? And then also mechanically. So how does it not stand out like a, um, a piece of glass in the nervous system or something like that, irritating all the time? 
And obviously with the bioelectric, we have to bioelectrically interface as well. And that's the information transfer. This the one thing that if you talk to a tissue engineer, in a lot of cases, they're going to develop a device and they talk a lot about the, bio, the nanoscale and this, in the cellular interaction and how they're going to control what proteins absorb on the surface and how they're managed. But that's pretty much it. And they look at the long-term survival of the device and the breakdown of the device and the polymers and things. For us, when I think about the nanoscale and when I think about where we're headed to clinic, I'm, I'm, I'm not as interested in a six-month study to show that I can put something in, the nerves are happy for six months. I'm much more interested, especially here in the work we do in Cleveland, is within 10 years, I like to have something that can last for 20 years in the device. I mean, ultimately, if it doesn't do that, then from a bioelectric standpoint, where I'm trying to interface with the nervous system long term for a device perspective, I'm not sure that we've accomplished our goal. So that information transfer is one part of it that's different. So I have to get information into and out of the nervous system, and there's a whole host of issues that come with that, in addition to understanding the cellular response. And I need it to be chronically stable for a 20-year uh, period of time. And then I think those last two are things that uh, more or less add a couple criteria into the bioelectric. And so the challenge is this integrated. I put dynamic on here, and I'm not going to talk a lot about it. Our material I would consider dynamic, but only marginally so. Uh, ultimately, what I'll talk about later, what I want you to think about, is one of the differences between the bio and abiotic interface is that most man-made things, the abi abiotic issues, are, in fact, static. When you put it in there, it's not self-healing for the most part. It doesn't change or evolve over time. Well, the body is constantly evolving and changing over time. And I think that leads to a lot of challenges that when we get to that kind of level and want to maintain an interface with the nerves for a period of time, that dynamic characteristic of the body, that rejuvenating, uh, changing aspect is something that we need to take into account, and that leads to the permanence. And of course, the, the, the challenge and where we're trying to go is that we want to restore uh, or get to increasing levels of function. So we've been very successful, as most of you here, at least in Cleveland, are aware, with devices that can interact on a one to maybe a thousand or you know, five thousand neurons type of level. So I can get muscle activation, I can control that muscle activation, I can get a restoration of function. And the reason I put this picture up here is, is I think of moving forward, we, you know, we're trying to do some work in sensory stimulation where I think we can be successful on, on a larger level. I think there's evidence that, you know, and probably motor as well, but certainly into the sensory, the closer we can get down, the more we can go to a one-to-one -one interaction with the nervous system, potentially the more sensory feedback we can restore. And so this is sort of an, an interest here, but uh, one of the things motivating this type of work. So like I said, I'm going to talk about the nano scale. What I see it as the, as, and the bioelectric interface and the key things that we have to worry about, kind of the state of art, what people are doing with the neural interfaces nowadays. And I think because cortical electrodes have worked quite a bit longer at trying to be at the neural, individual neuron level, I'm going to focus most today. On, on the cortical interface, the central nervous system, particularly in the cortex. Um, though I'll, I'll briefly talk about some of what we're going to do in the, in the peripheral or where we're starting to look at some of these things in the periphery, but I'll focus mostly on the cortical. And then I'm going to talk about the nanocomposite we've been developing for the last couple of years in one of these R21s that's showing some success now. It's been an, a really a fun and interesting mix across you know, materials, macromolecular, uh, MEMS processing, bio-MEMS processing, and then our own biologic work and testing things. And then I'll finish with the challenges that we talked about. So what is the nanoscale? I stole this from my introducer. <laughs> so this is a picture I think that Dawn put together. No? All right. I didn't steal it from her, so I'll retract that. And i got to find out where I got it from. So I <laughs> quoted the wrong person. That stinks. Um, so it's a nice picture <laughs> you're capable of. Anyway, this one it talks about when they kind of look at the levels, it breaks it down fairly nice that you start up at the kind of the three centimeter scale or multi centimeters where you're EEG, so broad scale of the brain, down to ECOG where you're just sitting on the surface, maybe smaller, half a centimeter, several millimeters, down to local field potentials where you're kind of a one millimeter field, and then down to single action potentials uh, and units kind of on the 200 nanometer. Which I think is, is right, um, but what I'm, what I'm getting to or I want to think about is that kind of takes us down to the advanced silicon arrays and, and devices there where I can interact on individual neurons. But to actually make that last long term, I have to consider the nanoscale, which goes one step down here. And this I know I took from the NIH roadmap on the nanomedicine, because <laughs> I have the website I got it from. Um, but they kind of put this all in scale while the tennis ball is more of a public side. On this side, we're getting down to actually the gene sitting in the cell wall that we interact with. And even though I maybe only want the single action potential in, a, in one neuron, to stay near that neuron sufficiently to keep that long term, I have to know what's happening basically down on the gene and the large 
protein that sits in the membrane, which is at the nanoscale. I mean, that is nanometer in size. And so that's what we're talking, what I'm talking about is essentially this glucose, the proteins in the channels, how they interact with each other, and all the things and signaling that goes on at that level is kind of what we have to think about to make the nanoscale work. And so what I put here is another thing I wanted to illustrate is that if you look at the axon interaction, essentially if I'm down here, I'm interacting with, and this is obviously kind of a hand-wavy graph, but a tenth of a neuron. I'm working at sub-parts of the neuron when I'm down, obviously, you know, water, glucose, the proteins themselves. I'm concerned with what the components of the neuron are doing. Um, and then as I start to move out, it's the neuron itself. And so I get somewhere out here where I'm talking about the cell level and I'm, talk, you know, I'm trying to get to this, this kind of 200 nanometer scale where I'm one neuron, one contact, or interact with single neurons, all the way up to what we kind of currently do now where the surface stimulation interacts with thousands of, of axons. So it kind of gives you an indication of you know, the level, the number of axons that we have a potential of talking with. The flip side of that though, which is kind of the bio side of the thing that I find interesting, is that as I start to go smaller and smaller, the thing to think about is if I can interact with an individual neuron, we tend to, you know, the focus on the nanoscale and how do I do that and how do I talk to a neuron, the flip side is if I can talk to a thousand neurons, there's a very big macro problem that goes with that, right? So how do I talk to, how do I even get information in and out of a thousand axons? So what if I can talk to every individual one of them? The problem is I can't put a thousand wires through there as we currently know them. So, even though we're talking macro and trying to get down to the interface at the single cell level, along with that by its nature, because I'm trying to communicate with this, I have a very much a macro issue as well. So macro, mic macro and nano are very closely interacted. That's kind of what I wanted to get through here. And this just lays out the technologies, kind of the scales that are at as I view them. Surface electrode technology, put on the surface, I get whole nerves, multiple nerves simultaneous, but these are things that are in the clinic. The work that we've been doing here, muscle-based stimulation, uh, intramuscular epimesial, extradural type of electrodes that, that are used quite regularly in the clinic are down to a smaller scale. Cuffs and DBS, obviously DBS has been very successful recently. We've been making some pretty good uh, progress with electrodes, cuff electrodes directly on peripheral nerves and acting with subparts. And a lot of work is going on at the, the silicon arrays trying to get down to, and I think we're probably, you know, this is clinical, moving clinical, this is clinical has had products on the market, this has got products on the market. This has probably got several years to get there before we have a long-term device. And this is years out before we even have a device that works at all. So it kind of gives you the progression as I view it going out through fundamental research into the clinic and what's been successful in the scale we're working at and where we're moving to. So that gives, a, the idea is to give a kind of an overview of how I view the landscape here. I want to talk about what the elements then as I start looking at the nanoscale of, uh, um, of the neural system, there's several things you have to think about that actually come into effect. If I want to work directly with an individual neuron, I can't let most of the inflammatory response just happen and accept what I get. I have to worry about like the injury repair um, process. What are all the signaling uh, cascades and how do I affect those and how am I involved with them throughout the process? So I'll talk a little about that. The foreign material response. It's okay if I want to encapsulate electrode and put a 100 micron thin capsule around it and deal with it. But if I need a micron, uh, an axon within 20 microns or 50 microns to be able to record that individual unit, I can't have a whole lot of foreign material response going on all the time. So I'll talk about some of the issues with that and how we have to deal with those. And the factors that kind of relate to these, and of course, are the surface chemistry of the material we have. How do I keep proteins off of there? How do I keep the device from fouling and ultimately causing a continuous response? I'll talk about that. That really is with the protein absorption, which leads to more or less a sustained type of foreign body reaction, where the, the body's always trying to deal with it. Mechanical mismatch, which I think is important, and uh, we'll show some data from things we've been collecting on that. And then shape. Uh, just some shape elements people have been showing make a difference, because it's similar to, you know, when you get down to that size, it's like what we think about when I think of a chair or a seat or whatever in here. This is the size of the axons. We're starting to build devices that axons like to or not be part of depending on their shape because you're on their same size scale. So axons tend to interact with things that have shapes that they like or material properties they like, different stiffnesses, and different cells interact with them differently. So all these things become very important at that nano scale where I actually want to interact directly with the neuron and control that. So briefly, and this is where, you know, depending who's in the audience, probably people much more uh, advanced in this than I am, but uh, fairly overview system. You know, basically in the, in the cortical system, we have this blood-brain barrier, which everybody's well aware of. Um, Well-controlled uh, environment here, 
where most of the communication of the chemical communication dealing with the neurons and out in this space is largely controlled by the astrocytes that connect to uh, effectively the capillaries in the brain. You have this basal laminar um, uh, pericytes, but they typically stay in here until there's an issue to come out for, such as uh, an insult or injury. And then it's well controlled what's going across. It's usually active transport across the endothelial cell as opposed to just broad diffusion. So that's in a controlled environment. And the other thing is the, the brain is sort of this immunologically privileged here. It's a different, it's not the same uh, immune response you would have if you cut yourself and you have all the macrophage or the um, polymorphic uh, nucleosides in the larger cell response. And so there's some sp specific things we'll talk about how they work. But the blood brain barrier is an important thing that it maintains the chemical environment. If this is violated, you're going to have cells interact and go at it, upregulate. Things that occur, you know, when you have um, agents that impair the blood brain barrier and things that happen, like the bradykinins, there's a whole list of chemicals here. And um, some of the key ones are like interleukin 6 and these different molecules, which I'm not going to spend a lot of time on today, except these are the things we look at and how we deal with on time. And what's important in this is that it's normal for. Um, the brain to go through if you have a, a rupture of a blood, uh, blood brain barrier or some um, damage in that, the body's natural response, you have to remember, is to repair it. So it's going to release all these things, but that's there for a reason. And so that's typically good. And I'll show some evidence of that, that if you violate that and allow it to go, it's going to be a good thing. But when I stick a device in there, I'm actually adding something else to this that keeps it going. And that's where we start running into problems. And we have to figure out how to deal with that. Um, and then there are the steroids that, in fact, help the, um, the blood-brain barrier. And people are trying to use those to assist in devices. And I'll talk about why I think that's a bit of a challenge. Here's, here's why this is an issue. So why not just avoid the blood vessels, right? When you insert, try and not hit one. I'm sure there's space in there. The reality is these are castings. And this is kind of in the microns scale. These are castings of the brain. This is the in the cortical, or top of the cortical region, the down to where the vein goes. It's pretty much impossible to insert a device into this system here without hitting something and in, in, in blood, breaking a blood vessel. So you're bound to, by inserting something stiff, you're inserting something in there, you're bound to cause some damage and basically incite this reaction. So the idea of being able to insert a device and let it go like it, it um, so it don't even initiate that response is probably not likely to happen, at least to the current systems. I'll kind of revisit that in a second. So blood, you know, the blood, it's a highly capillarized um, tissue. So you're going to cause some damage when you go in. And this was Bjornsson and a few others have published this. That they've looked at many different ways of trying to insert electrodes. They've actually done studies on do you do it fast, slow, how do you do the insertion. And, and no matter what they do, there's going to be blood vessels that you're going to break. Um, when that happens, then you kind of upregulate this response. You get these factors that come out there. Basically, um, we'll go to this one, the resting microglia, which are kind of the macrophages of the neural system or the central nervous system. They sit in a resting state most of the time, and they become activated and turn more or less into the macrophage activity, um, resting or alerted. Once the, the, and the environment kind of comes with self-feedback that turns the microglia into these activated microglia, which form the macrophage, the cleanup activity in here. Uh, work with some lymphocytes in the area and more or less upregulate astrocyte, astrocyte activity, which, you know, less than 25% of your brain is neural cells. The rest of it are, are basically astrocytes in these glia that are maintaining the environment. So as they're upregulated, uh, this whole process is what's going on uh, in, the, in the cortex. And ultimately, we want to, you want this to happen, basically, for a period of time to fix the, the blood-brain barrier, but then you want it to shut down. And what tends to happen if I have this continuous insult in here is that you have this probe, and then you have, these, you have the activated microglia. You have these uh, cells that sit right in here that are always dumping these chemical factors, the, the, the TNF-alphas and the interleukin-6 and the different molecules, trying to kind of get rid of this electrode, the same idea, get rid of this foreign response, what's going on. And as that's happening, while initially neurons are OK, with these factors, they're not immediately neurodegenerative. So if you drop interleukin-6, you drop one of these molecules quickly, it's not going to degenerate immediately that axon. It'll kind of go into this, what was um, listed here, sort of this endangered neuron. But it doesn't degenerate right away. But if this reaction continues, then you tend to get this sort of dead zone around the electrode, this place where the neurons either retract from or die in that area. And so this kind of continual response, if we can't manage it, leads to problems for axons in passing, for coming into here, et cetera. And that's, that's where we have a problem. So you get this active astrocytic response around here. You get the macrophage or uh, activated microglia up in this region, inflammatory cells that continue to react here. 
Um, and so that's the process. What keeps it going? Well, this is a surface mediated response. There's no foreign material receptor per se in the body. I mean, if you, uh, what happens is proteins absorb to the surface, and it's pretty much impossible to put any, uh, most surfaces in there without getting some protein that sets down on the surface. And as we all know, protein, when it hits that surface, if it changes conformations, essentially it becomes denatured, inactivated, it doesn't look normal to the body anymore, it doesn't have what it, what it did before. And once it changes the configuration, and that's when the body recognizes it as the foreign material. So it's not as much the material itself as it is the proteins that absorb to the surface and begin to activate this whole event that goes on and then continues to keep it around. Um, so one of the things is the surface chemistry to try and prevent this from happening. And so there's a fair amount of work going on that there's been a lot done in blood and the um, non-following blood surfaces. And, and there's a fair amount of work that's starting on the neural interface here. And I'll, I'll introduce some of that. Jeff Capadona, one of my colleagues, does, is working towards this direction here in that aspect of it, how to manage at the surface, as well as some of the, the uh, mechanics of the device. And we'll talk about that a little bit. So the continued response really is this protein absorption and things going on at the surface that continually excite or irritate, if you will, the system. And you can't necessarily get rid of it. Particularly, the other thing that's a bit of a challenge, you know, we don't, we don't think about it. If you think of a... Um, or to be aware of in the bioelectric system is if I had a, if I could uh, do, say, a cardiovascular implant, I could put it in and I could coat everything with a certain um, non-following surface. If I'm in bioelectric, I'm pushing charge in and out of this system. As I'm doing that, I'm doing, there's potentially oxidation reduction reactions at that electrode. Somehow you're pushing electrons into an ionic movement that changes the surface um, um, potential. And even there, so you have to worry, even if you put the great coating on, you're going to have potential changes that become an issue for protein, sometimes like a positive surface, sometimes a negative. So you have more than an, just a plain surface that you've got to get just right. You have an active surface that's always changing, and so that's an added challenge to this whole thing. And then what's absorbed is a milieu of many different things, and different cells respond to each of them in different ways. So I think the other thing to think about from the nanoscale level is I can't just have one miracle coating, most likely. You, you have to work on a... a, a a bunch of different things that potentially come and sit on this cell. And so it's, there's a complicated set of things going on here. The one I want to, I'll spend more time focusing on today is the mechanical interactions. And uh, this is that I think for a while has been sort of ignored, not, not for any good reasons, just been looking on the other ones. Um, but mechanics make a difference. Um, astrocytes are, there's a lot of act uh, mechanical sensitive cells sitting in the cortex. Astrocytes, for one, as they get activated, this is a, this is in culture, but this is a confluent cell layer of connected astrocytes. If you touch the pipette, uh, if you touch the pipette, <laughs> just to the central neuron here, I have to give a talk soon. I'll have to hurry. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> Lisa didn't say you're done. Get sit down. Um, so if I just touch and mechanically disturb the central cell here. <laughs> This opens mechanical sensitive calcium channels. Calcium influx comes in as what we're monitoring here. But that wave, without touching anything else, will propagate throughout this culture. And so even though you may think that it's a local mechanical thing and I can just deal with surface effects first, the reality is uh, my hypothesis, our hypothesis we're working on is that in fact, surface chemistry has a local effect, but mechanics have a local and a distant effect, okay? So, not only are you going to have this propagating calcium wave potentially throughout the astrocytes themselves, so they communicate at a distance, but you're also going to have the mechanics of the system itself. So if the electro is pulling, also remember that these astrocytes are connected to blood vessels and then they extend over a distance and connect to another neuron or they connect to other astrocytes throughout this system. So they're kind of sensing a larger environment. And if you're yanking on it over here, it's connected and giving that signal somewhere else. So they're behaving at a distance. I think mechanics have a, there's a, a fairly clear, in the literature, there's a fairly clear chain you can follow to the importance of, of ultimately mechanics in causing eventually either a continued response or damage itself. And the calcium, we all, I think we're pretty clear that calcium is the key component, obviously, in most cellular regulation um, in terms of uh, cytoskeletal activity. It's also one of the key ions or the key uh, components of the capase chains or in the, in, the, in the cell death apoptosis chain pathways, calcium is a key player. 
And so if you upregulate this in, in the cell itself, it will induce changes. Initially, it, might, it will induce, it's one of the key players when it comes to cellular motility. As they move along, the mechanics of the system induce some calcium currents, which then relate to the changing remodeling of the uh, cytoskeletal elements. So just the mechanics are gonna upregulate what's going on in the cells and start producing some things from the cytoskeletal level. And if that continues over a long period of time, um, that could have effect on uh, just the calcium signaling internally and whether that's leading to neural responses going on or um, augmenting, for example, the neurodegenerative versus neuroprotective factors of the, all these chemicals we're talking about. If I influence that with a calcium signal based on mechanics, uh, I think they're gonna have, they're gonna have a, um, effect together. So like I said, the communicated distance. The other interesting thing, and I kind of thought it was dead end, it was every great thing. Once you start doing the reading, there's a million things that tie to what you thought you were original on. Um, it turns out that much of the literature now, uh, there's a, a link to the mechanics and calcium channels in, say, for example, schizophrenia or uh, Alzheimer's disease. So these plaques, as they start to build in the brain, they have a mechanic, they're, they're stiff, right? They're a little irritation in the brain, and there's evidence that that mechanical irritation of the building plaque is as much as something else causing part of this continued response of, of what's going on. So calcium, and not necessarily calcium, but the whole um, mechanics is, is implicated in many different ways. So I think mechanics are a very important part of the brain and part of the process that we need to take into account. Um, let me show just some uh, responses to silicon, so these things in practice, if you will. Um, this is the response to a Michigan microelectrode, uh, one of the um, daggers, if you will. That's not the right term, but the Michigan arrays. Sorry, you said squish earlier. I had to get one out there. The, um, <laughs> sorry, the Michigan uh, probes, which are widely used. Uh, this is basically, um, Braun, Tresco, and Martin put this out a while ago, that you see here immediately, corresponding to that earlier paper, you have the activated microglia, basically the macrophages of the system here, active on the surface that are trying to interact with that probe and, and, and remove it, basically. You have this next kind of layer outside of that, which the astrocytes are activated, uh, the GFAP active, which are laying down. I mean, basically, the G, um, they're activated laying, laying the proteins. You have neurons then outside of that, but there's this zone in here, which if you look at the scale, is about 100 microns. Now, as I said earlier, I may not have put it out strongly, but ultimately, to record individual units, people have estimated you need 50 microns or closer to be able to do that reliably. So already, in this response, um, I'm at 100 before I have the first cell body. And here's the neural filament itself. So these are, these are cell bodies, neural cell bodies. These are filaments, and it's, there's probably a few running in there, but it's fairly sparse in that region where you have this ongoing response where these guys are dumping not neural-friendly chemicals because their intent is to get rid of the foreign body that's in there. And so this becomes a hostile environment to the neurons, and they don't want to necessarily come in that close. So if I want individual access to the neurons, I'm gonna to have to figure out a way to minimize that. This is a response that's from one of the Utah arrays. Um, basically, and there's many different theories as to why this happens, but have taken out, I think, 10 months. Uh, there's a fairly dense fibrous or you know, uh, scarring tissue sitting here in the depth of these things. Now, these still work, which is, is, is good from an electrical standpoint because the tips actually turn out to be fairly close. If you looked at the tip here, I think you can keep neurons fairly close and these tend to work and you probably know better, Don, actually for length and lifetime of these guys. But you can get a recording from them over time. I think there's some more issues with the mechanics, uh, you know, a piece of silicon lasting 20 years before it tends to fracture given that it's brittle in the brain and things. So there are other issues from the engineering, again, the macro scale and the other side of the picture, not just talking to the neurons, but how do I engineer the system to do that that can last 20 years? So these are some examples of the kind of response we're looking at. What I will show you in most of the, the uh, graphs for is our response. We tend to look at the activated microglia, the astrocytes, and the neurons, uh, and their location of the probe is an indicator of how we're doing. So this, is, uh, this goes at the fact that the device continues to promote that response. You're gonna, have a, you're gonna have damage when you insert, but if I leave that device in there chronically, you know, at two weeks, even if I stab and pull out, even at two weeks, I have a reduced response, but I still have a response. Something's going on, it's cleaning up the damage, as you would expect. Um, but at four weeks, we're looking at microglia, the astrocytes themselves, and the neural cell bodies all have a similar thing, and that four weeks, microglia you can't see, they're not trying to, not trying to macrophage the device, they're not trying to eat the device anymore. Yet when I have a device, 
I have a pretty vigorous response around that device, so it's maintained. So the damage itself isn't what's causing this long term necessarily here, it's the continued activation. This, it's been termed the frustrated phagocytosis uh, response, which sounds cool, but basically just means the cells are trying to keep getting rid of the device. Astrocytes, they're still in here trying to, you know, wall off or, or, or deal with the, um, with the probe that's still here. There's a little bit of a response, but ultimately this has gone back uh, quite a bit more towards baseline after four weeks. And the flip side of that is the neural cell bodies going along with what we said earlier where these guys are dropping chemicals, you know, basically signaling that aren't conducive to the neuron. If I still leave the device, you see this annulus here around the device devoid of neurons where, where the stab was, you can, it's pretty much filled back in. And so there's, you know, basically the evidence that the device itself is causing a continued response in some manner. So, and, and ultimately I, I look at this as well from the standpoint that neurons are back in there. So the damage itself is not good, but ultimately the, the, if you look at the time scale of things, because I think, again, I want to reemphasize that the time scale of a response is important. And, and uh, just you know, so the personal anecdote, when I, when I started getting into this, I wanted to figure out what the signaling, you know, I'm an engineer, right? So I want to know the pathways in which all these signals go together and, you know, what the rates of them are and which chemical is important to one or the other. You start looking at the neurodegenerative and the, the neuroinflammatory and all these, they have all the same chemicals in them. And there's arrows pointing to each other. <laughs> so it became kind of, uh, you know, it's kind of frustrating when you see that one thing is doing neuroprotective in one pathway and neurodegenerative in another, and you don't have any idea what the balance between them is. So I think some of these ideas of um, bioinformatics and understanding the pathways is important. But, but the key is, I think, um, and this is all more speculative, hypothetical from my perspective right now, is that the time course will make a difference. So if I have one signaling molecule short term, it'll put the neuron into kind of this statusis while it's doing the cleanup like it's supposed to. But if I keep it over a prolonged period of time, that goes into more of a neurodegenerative effect. So timing is important as well in how we do this, in addition to having the continued response from the device. The other thing that is quite interesting, though, is that the variability, there's a high degree of variability between different insertions and different devices when you put them in. And so one device sitting right here has a pretty vigorous response, where another one has almost no response. And so what's causing that is, is still debated, I think, amongst places. But it could be that this device is near potentially a blood vessel that has a continual leakage going on or some other things that may have been caused by this. But I've also seen these sitting right next to blood vessels where they're not that vigorous of response. So it may be that this one is jostled. In fact, this paper, I think, says that there was an excessive amount of bleeding around that electrode when it was put in compared to the other one. And so maybe there's some motion. There's a lot of different factors that could lead to this. But the fact is, the response is quite variable depending on the situation, what's going on. So another challenge to deal with. Alice. And this is kind of the last thing, uh, just kind of setting up what, what matters on the, on the size and shape scale, is that, again, we're in spatial control um, over presentation of the bioactive domains. Basically, it cares, the neurons care what things look like. And, you know, 3D structure matters, and that's why a lot of the you know, interesting things from culture is 3D structure. You don't want to just build a flat um, glass cover slip because they behave differently than they would in a 3D scaffolding, uh, neurons in, in multi-cells. So neurons are sensitive in the, in the cells in the, in, the, in the body in general are sensitive to the 3D architecture that you have there. And so this is kind of an evidence of a study that's done with different um, fibronectin things with different widths of the fibronectin lines where wide ones where you can sufficiently get a hold, the, the neuron can grab a hold of it, tends to be much more vigorous than the narrow ones. And so um, shape matters at this point and how you present the spatial domain, if you will, to the neurons is important. And so another level at which we need to think of when we start engineering to talk to the cells at the cellular level is the spatial domain. Um, helps regulate the intercellular interactions and, and basically guide attachment and proliferation. A lot of the work in, I mean, there's a lot of work in peripheral nerve regeneration even where, where guidance cues, which are guidance channels, neuron or um, uh, uh, Schwann cell tubes and, and different things and artificial constructs of that are important for creating bridging over a long peripheral distance. So we talked about this, um, the neuroprotective versus neurodegenerative, the fact the pathways are all kind of intermixed, and I think that there's a, a dynamic inter interaction, both spatial and temporal, in, in what's happening in those interactions that are to be teased out yet. And this was from Pat Tresco in the, um, I forget what the, the brain computer interface world tour they did between NSF and NIH and looking at what the state of the brain computer interfaces was. And he basically concluded in 2008, anyway, that after analysis of the peer-reviewed literature, two workshops, the visits, uh, major gaps still remain in understanding of the science behind the loss of function that occurs with time. And so 
there's a lot of things going on here and we're still trying to tease all that out. But the, the key thing is at the nanoscale, that's what's important, I think, to understand that. So when I define, as, as in, in the context, of biointerfaces at the nanoscale, it is essentially how do I manage this protein, this response, this interaction at that level. And I think that's where we need to go to be able to get these devices to interact reliably with single neurons over a long period of time. Some other things to consider, I've hit on them a little bit. Um, a bioelectric, its connection, its active communication is essential to the bioelectric interface. I mean, that's why we put them in there, is to talk to them. So that's a consideration that we have. And then the electrochemistry. I mean, uh, right now, we convert free electron flow in metal lattices to ion flow in the body, right? And there's a fairly uh, extensive literature on the electrochemistry at that interface and how we deal with it. Um, when we start talking about polymers and systems that have proteins on the surface and different characteristics than just having the, the metal, we have to deal with a new way of, or we have to consider how is that charge going to affect that surface for the proteins? How is that energy going to be charged, sent across that? And if we start moving forward to polymer systems, like I'm going to present next, how do I even get the information in there, right? I mean, so my colleagues in the, uh, the MEMS group are trying to make electrodes, and it's not trivial, I don't think. <laughs> um, I, they just can't give me one the next day, darn it. Actually, they're pretty good, but it's, it's how are we going to connect to this thing long term? How are we going to get this information in and out? And so those are issues that we deal with here, the bioelectric. This is a, one of the fancy pictures. Um, these are the, still the workhorse, I would say. This is the microwire electrodes put in there because they're probably the most durable and reliable. Um, so for long-term recording and things, often this is what we go with. These are the silicon equivalents thereof that have been developed uh, in many different places. So this is the Utah array, which most people are probably familiar with in this room. So this pin, um, I don't call it that either. It's essentially this array of <coughs> electrodes. It's this made with silicon, so you can intersect circuitry on the back of it trying to solve the connection problem. The Michigan arrays, where you can put them in many different configurations, multiple electrodes up and down the shank and different things. Um, slant array, actually those are two of the same thing, sorry. Um, the other, this is a, I put it up there because it's an idea, it's the same ideas, but it's in the spinal cord. So again, central down to the spinal cord, and people are trying to do these things in the periphery as well. Um, but the other thing that's of interest is, again, people are starting to look at this at the nanoscale. How do I manage the cellular response? And so there's the fluidics approach where they want to dump, say, dexamethasone or things that maintain, so uh, steroids that maintain the interface over a period of time. Um, and one of the big problems when you think of, if you talk to a tissue engineer, everybody loves drug delivery. And I, I think that's very interesting. It's great if your drug delivery is six months or six weeks or six days, depending what the drug is. The problem is if I load this surface, it's going to be gone shortly. And, and most of the stuff that have loaded these with dexamethasone or other steroids work beautifully for the six weeks that have steroids in there. And then once they're gone, you go right back to the original response. So again, when we look at a 20-year solution, it's, it's hard. There's challenges with that because the drug will disappear in our current models. You load it, it's going to be gone. And so I have some thoughts on that later as well, some directions to go. But the approach here is that I could keep loading, so I have a conduit of not just electrical information, but also fluidic information, if you will. Uh, different interfaces, these are different um, coatings, so it's not a metal coating. You have the AROFs and stuff like that, but then also people have been working with PDOTs and different um, polymer coatings on here for charge density reasons. And then more importantly for what I want to go to next is this idea of the mechanic mismatch between the, the brain and the probes. And I'll spend some more time on that in a minute. People are looking at polyamid uh, and, and different structures, paralink C, trying to create devices out of them which are much softer or much lower modulus, much clo well, are closer than the silicon probes in terms of their moduli. And so some of these are the materials themselves. And other approaches are this, where they coat devices, for example, in hydrogels. Um, that's the approach. I actually don't. I don't haven't seen literature yet onto the results of doing that. Um, we talked about size and shape factors. These are the kind of the coatings with these P dots. So if you have a coat, if you put a gel coating on the device, this is the kind of the Achilles heel of it. The idea of the gel coating is when it goes in, it goes in stiff. When it's dehydrated, it goes into the body, swells up, and then it's soft. But the problem is you swell up to about 100, 150 microns. So if that's the distance away, you're already at the same problem you were before, before you even have the cellular response. And so the solution that people have been looking at is growing these conductive polymers through this gel. Um, and I think that's challenging. I had some inside information last week when I was talking that it's not being as successful as people would like yet. So there's still challenges to make this process work to have a conductor that goes through this gel. The other thing which I think are interesting approaches, uh, again, coming out of the Michigan group, is, again, size and shape matter. 
And so they've been able to produce these devices where the, the, the bulk, the mechanical support is in one section, but they can make incredibly thin outriggers, they call them, or different fins that are very, very small. So where they want the, the idea is that they'll put an electrode out here. So they still get a response here, they'll deal with it, um, but if it stays away from here, they've shown that, at least in some of the literature, that in fact the response here, because of the size characteristics, is minimal. So the body is responding not only to the surface protein characteristics that we talked about, but also just the size of this device. And by making this thin outrigger, they have solutions in doing that. And they're also looking at different um, non-planar to allow more of the uh, communication, the chemical flow, if you will, throughout the brain. Uh, so designing devices with via holes and trying to minimize essentially the footprint, the spatial footprint that these probes have. So a lot of different work, state of the art, where people are trying to make silicon work from different materials. And then of course the more, um, as a, um, more advanced or different ideas that people have been trying, which is the in situ polymerization or even trapping neural cells uh, on there to try and get the neural cells to go talk to other neural cells but the problem is you still have to interface with the neural cell you had in the first place, and, and the issue of trapping that cell long term is still um, up in the air. Surface coatings, these, these are all anti, um, steroids basically to try and manage the response, and we'll go on from that in the surface morphology. So that's kind of a background, quick, mind you, obviously, but the idea of the breadth of the things to keep in mind when you're dealing with a nanoscale interface, it's not just sticking it in there and not breaking blood vessels, there's a whole host of things that are gonna happen, and it's everything from the shape to the mechanics to the, to the surface. So what I wanna talk to you about today is some work that we've been doing to address this stiffness problem, and it's, uh, it's been a team Ultimately, uh, the other reason I'm interested in the nanoscale is if you look at kind of the evolution of macromolecular engineering or chemistry, it started out with kind of the individual molecules and reactions, but now you can build chains of molecules that are in the nanoscale. So you can construct and engineer systems on the molecular polymer level. MEMS has been pushing smaller and smaller in this processing, so they went from the microns level to the submicrons level, so they're kind of approaching the, from the other game, and that's right where our sweet spot is, because that's the proteins, that's where, you know, I mean, that's the cell level, so they all kind of converge, and so we've, this has been a, a nice, the work I'm gonna talk about here has been a great, uh, in, in my mind, it's been fun, juxtaposition of those three different areas. So let's look at this problem from the mechanics. Uh, if you look at moduli, tungsten is that, is one of the classic, wires that you'd put in there, stiff, long term, it has a modulus in the 100 gigapascal range, okay? If you look at silicon, that's probably about 10, 10 gigapascal. Same thing with glass, they're very similar. Silicon's a form of glass, right? Silicon dioxide and stuff. So the silicon and glass are about the same, around um, 10 to 100 uh, gigapascal. Polyimide, which is the next greatest solution or what people are working towards, is still in the hundreds of megapascal. And that's all fine until you look at, I mean, that's, that's a couple orders of magnitude, which is good, but this is the range the brain is in. And the literature kind of, dis, you know, there's a wide range depending which part of the brain you're looking at and how you do it. But it's anywhere from a kilopascal, which is like jello, loose jello, to maybe a couple hundred kilopascal, which is maybe a rubber band at best. And even that, I think, is probably stiffer than the brain. So this is the region we want to be. If I want my device to mechanically disappear, I want to be down here. The reason everybody's up here though is if I have a device that's jello and I'm trying to get it into jello, how are you gonna do it, all right? So the challenge is I gotta get this thing in there. <coughs> um, oh, this is just some, again, the, the range is the gigapascals, so I just went through that. <clears throat> and actually, interesting, carbon nanotubes are up in the terapascal, which is, um, we're looking at, cell, we're using cellulose, you'll see, but na carbon nanotubes might be an option for us too for various ways. So how can I modulate, essentially what the, the challenge starting this project was, how do I get a device that's this stiff so I can get it into the brain, but that turns to this stiff over time? And the things that, you know, basic different ways that people can modulate, or uh, modulate the modulus, change the modulus in a device, phase transition, you go from a solid to a fluid, right? So if you go to plastic glass, transition temperature of a material, it goes from a, a solid state to the, starts to free up a little bit, goes into its flowable state. Swelling, those are the polymer, the, the hydrogels where you fill it with water and expand and now it's basically water caught in there. Different cross-linking, chain cross-linkings, different ways of meshing polymers, systems like that. Uh, that can be ion mediated or chemically mediated. Electro-rheologics, so I apply a current, changes the, pol the, the state. We said, well, there's this interesting thing called the sea cucumber that has a, a natural way of doing it that we, we ended up uh, using it as a bio-inspiration. This sea creature, the sea cucumber, normally it's fairly pliable. So when it's not threatened, it just you know, waddles around its environment or 
mushes around its environment, whatever term you want to use, but moves around very flexibly. But when somebody threatens this thing, it goes very stiff. Several order of magnitudes change. So what happens, people have studied this, the biologists, and this is why I spend way too much time watching Discovery Channel, because it's pretty much every solution to the problem we have is there somehow. I just got to figure out how to implement it. So the cool thing is the way, in, in essence, the way this works is it has a nanocomposite for its skin. And so at one level, it's got it filled up with cellulose fibers or a fiber, a very stiff fiber. And then it's embedded in a very soft matrix. Okay? So you can think of this, think of a building, if you will, where all the girders, you can control the bolts. And the building itself is paper or something, you know, a very rubbery material. If I pull all the bolts out of the girders, the thing will collapse to whatever I get the rubber doing. Okay, so that's the, that what controls the soft state. But if I can reconnect those girders at any time I want, it'll become stiff again based on the connection of that, you know, that structure on the inside. And so basically, the sea cucumber sits in, when it's flexible, the soft state, all these interconnected um, nanocomposite or nanofibers in here aren't connected. They're just kind of floating around each other. When it gets threatened, it releases tensilin. Uh, which is, connects these uh, long chains together and locks them, becomes rigid. Okay? And so the nanocomposite side is how do we build that? You know, so that's the, that's the inspiration. And I remember talking to the macro guys, they're like, hey, we got this thing, it changes dynamics. You'd be interested? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so from that, we've been working for five years now. So it was a nice lunch conversation basically that started that project, but it worked out pretty cool. So this is um, basically the matrix we've been developing. Um, this is cellulose fiber. It's probably the most common polymer in nature. And paper, cotton, everything has it. Um, we get it from tunicates, basically because Jimmy, my grad student, wanted to go to New England and jump in really disgusting water to collect these for us. <laughs> you could get it from cotton and things like that, but we actually chose tunicate because it has probably the highest um, uh, aspect ratio of materials out there. So it has a very long aspect ratio. So you want long, stiff fibers to try and percolate through your network to make it easy to connect it up. But basically, you go harvest these things in New England, uh, and I won't spend much time. You dissolve all the proteins. You run it through this really nasty situ uh, process, bleach it, macerate it, hydrolyze it, and in the end, you get basically just these long crystalline cellulose chains that have aspect ratios where they're maybe one, you know, a tenth to three microns long and only a few nanometers wide, so very long, thin fibers. These things, we tried a lot of different things early on to try and get them to connect. This is where the nanoscale comes in here, is that the materials, you know, working with materials on the nanoscale, they have interesting properties that, uh, and I'm not going to try to go into them in much detail, that would be the macro side of it, but how to get these guys to interact appropriately was a lot of time. The initial thought was if we put uh, a bunch of magnesium or, or like charged ions on, on these things. We decorate them with carboxylic acid or something like that that's negatively charged. And if I don't cover up that charge, they're all going to repel each other. Right? So they float around. So the idea initially was if I put a monovalent negative in here, when I throw it in the body and I've got two uh, divalent ions, they're going to hook up and then connect them that way. And that was a complete <laughs> failure. It didn't work. Turns out these guys hydrogen bond very strongly. And so just putting them in water will tend to disperse them because water will, will basically shield them from each other. They disperse. When you dry them out, they hydrogen bond very tightly and, then, and connect up. And it turns out that our chemical signal, very simply, was hydrogen bonding. And so uh, Jeff Cappadona and the team over there, our group, basically worked out ways of dealing with these fiber gels because they do tend to hydrogen bond very tightly. They tend to aggregate if you don't treat them properly. So there's a whole bunch of work we went through. We, I say we in the loose part for me, but the team over in the macro, of how to get these guys well dispersed. Because to get the system to work well, you've got to have these fibers separated in, in the solution, in the matrix, uh, pretty uniformly. And if we don't do it right, they crash out. You just get this bunch of clumps in there. And that was good enough. That work is unique enough, and particularly the way they do it, to get some publication in nature in the processing. But in the end, we create this, um, by one of various different techniques, we'll create this matrix of this um, uh, fiber mesh network. And then we Im embed that basically in a polymer system. And then compression mold it, and you get a flat sheet of this nanocomposite. And we can do something with. Now, this is where the fun of a multidisciplinary team comes together. Because at that point, the macro guys are done. They're interested in that. But they just go run it in the DMA for a while, show the techniques. But I still don't have a neural probe. Right? So to actually make this work, um, we need to turn that into an electrode, and that's, uh, I'll talk about that in a minute. So what are the characteristics of this, this material? Um, we went through a couple different iterations early on, 
in terms of the matrix that we used and how it worked. And we were able to go from a couple megapascal down a little bit, but we didn't have the range we needed. So we're trying to get, our, our target was, what I told them I needed was a gigapascal, five gigapascal to put it into the brain. And we did some calculations of the PM matter and what it takes for buckling force given the size of the probes. Said I need five gigapascal for this guy's probe, but the brain's down at a couple hundred kilopascal. I need, that's what I need out of you. And so they got this, um, you get this polymer and they actually use a multiplicity of, um, of things. So not only do we have the polymer itself that makes a shift in, in, in the dynamics, but also it goes through the glass transition temperature of the polymer itself. So when it's below body, conveniently they could pick polyvinyl acetate, PVAC, which has a glass transition temperature, which basically means it goes from a very uh, a glassy state where the, the <coughs> polymer chains are locked to they start to flow around each other. That's the glass transition temperature. It's kind of a phase state. It's right around just above room temperature, but just below body temperature if we do that. And so this is the state, if I take that polymer alone, PVAC, and I run it through a, a temperature sweep. So what they do is it's in this machine that gen, um, slowly heats it up and then cools it down while it's continually vibrating it and measuring what the modulus of that material is. And so if you plot that over time, it starts at 1.8 gig, which is a little lower than I wanted, but not bad. Gets, only, gets down to 156, then kind of crashes out. So I couldn't get this up high enough to implant. We tried a few of these, they wouldn't go in necessarily at the size we wanted. So by adding the polymer, so by adding the nanocomposite, 16%, I can kick it up to the five gigapascal I need. So in the dry state already, or in the cold, in the um, glassy dry state, I added you know, about a factor of five in the modulus that gets me up to where I need to do. The other nice thing is it didn't have this gradual shift because the problem is if I'm cooling, here at the point where I'm trying to implant in the brain, I'm already down to 135. That's actually not going to work. Even though I got it up here, I'd have to implant this thing cold. Could do it, but it's not necessarily desirable. Here, by adding this polymer, and this is where the nanocomposites and the idea of the materials come in, is that it changes the characteristics that it pushes out that glass transition temperature all the way out to where I wanted it, about 37 and a half. So by adding the nanocomposite, I got a nice flat area in where I want it from room temperature, and then in fact it dives off. And so the dry, Problem is when I get out here, the dry, it's not the problem, but the, the dry stays actually fairly stiff, which isn't, isn't bad. So a lot of that load, what isn't taken here is being taken by that matrix I have on the inside. Nice though, is when I add water, this thing dives right down to almost the same thing. So if you look at for all the different loadings of this matrix polymer that we have in there, so the, the cellulose whiskers, they all come, out, come the same place, indicating that in fact you're getting this, the, the polymer itself is carrying the load, not the, the matrix in there. So when it's dry, the cellulose whiskers carry the load, and when it gets moist, it's down to the matrix. So it meets what we were trying to do. And from doing this, um, so that's just highlighting that. We could do this over uh, you know, about 13 minutes. So the important thing here is that over the temperature range, um, with, with having if I don't have any whiskers, it's just down low. I can't implant this thing. But by adding the whiskers, I have about 13 minutes to work with this. It's perfect, right? In the sense that I can go in, I can insert into the brain. I've got 10 to 13 minutes to do it, and then I'm soft. So the time frame is very good for what we're trying to accomplish. It's long enough. And we go from 5.1 gigapascal down to about 2 megapascal. Still higher than I want, ultimately, but it's lower than anything people have put in so far. And it gives us something to test our hypothesis. Rapid meaning within minutes, so it works fine to go from the giga down in what we want to do. So basically it disappears right after the, or it goes down right after the implant. Um, it's physi physiologic relevant in, in terms of the range. It's not quite where we want, but it gets there. And then we've been doing some degradation studies where we put it in ACSF for you know, three months and we don't see any significant degradation, so it's got possibility for lasting. This, is a, this work was published in Science because it's the first kind of nanocomposite material doing this. This is the video of the whole thing. If you take this nanocomposite room temperature, You can see, it just goes, so this is a little block of uh, gel. It's about like the brain. Inserted that in there. So it's actually in, the, in that little block of gel. This is in the dry state. Then we remove it. Just drop it in a little beaker of uh, ACSF. Start the we really didn't cheat version. <laughs> we won't do this in real time, don't worry. 15 minutes later, Go ahead and pull that thing out and it won't insert, so it's softened up. So it works. And this is kind of the time course of doing that. So we go from our stiff target state of five gigapascal down to about 15 minutes in our testing down to this um, megapascal range, two megapascal. So that was encouraging. 
So now we have this. So here's what I first showed you is the dynamic range of materials as they exist out there and they're static, the brain area we're trying to get at. And then what we had in a PVAC composite now is we have something that goes from five gigapascal down to two, almost to the brain range, but still in the top end. There's literature uh, that looks at specifically polymers and, and in vitro systems at least, and what cells respond to. And according to those, we need to get down to the kind of the tens of kilopascal. And at that point, cells, the astrocytes versus the neurons will differentiate who's more attractive to a given material. So I think it's sub 10 kilopascal. Neurons tend to like to be there over 10 kilopascal. Uh, astrocytes have more propensity to be on that material. I can't remember the exact number, but somewhere around there. So down in the tens where we really are trying to get from the, the short surface things. But by getting to here, I think you look at two effects, right? There's the bulk and there's the local. The local means this is what the cells are holding and grabbing onto, right? So when they're trying to explore their environment, they kind of feel what that local effect is, what the surface of the material is. So if I'm holding onto the surface of the desk and I'm pulling, I can feel what that desk is. If I get down to the bulk, as the desk moves around, I'm trying to hold onto it, I feel that kind of in the bulk of the, of the tissue. So I think we can address some of the bulk issues and we need to look going further. We've also developed, and I'll show a few pieces of data, though it's still um, questionable how we do it, a uh, PDMS system using the nanocomposite. It's not dynamic for various reasons, uh, largely because PDMS is hydrophobic and we need water to get in there, and so kind of messes with the whole switching mechanism. But basically, we can get PDMS with the nanocomposite in there. So you can't get PDMS that stiff until we put the nanocomposite. We can actually build a PDMS probe that's up at the four to five gigapascal, matches the other. And then by changing the composition of the uh, cross-linking mix in the PDMS, we can get all the way down to about 100 kilopascals. So we're starting to get in the range with the materials that we look at. Uh, so that's fairly encouraging. I'll show a little bit of preliminary data, but we got a lot more work to do on that. So we turned this over. We gave a sheet of material off to um, Allison and Jeremy and Chris Zorman's lab uh, in, the, in the MEMS department and said, make something out of this. And you can't put it in bad temperature. And you can't put it in these acids. And you can't put it in all the stuff you normally chew things up with. So just go make this thing for us and let us know when you're done. So that's the handoff challenge. And they came up with ways of basically making this probe. They worked with laser. Uh, laser techniques. And they're working right now on micro molding systems. So we're pushing them to do some really cool ideas of how to build probes on the nanoscale or down at this using materials that aren't amenable to the standard MEMS techniques. And so that's, that's kind of fun from that perspective as well. So this is the probe they've been able to build for us uh, on a penny. So down the same size scale as a, a Michigan type of probe, which is really pretty cool. This is the comparison in the first set of data that we've done. This is just a standard Teflon coated uh, tungsten wire. And so the first thing we put in was the stiff tungsten wire with Teflon coating versus this nanocomposite probe. This is the process Jimmy uh, Harris has come up with and is uh, doing a lot of this work with the neuroscience. Uh, neuroscience, um, Bob Miller and his lab has helped out tremendously in doing this. And then Jimmy's been uh, boots on the ground and really figured out several problems because the implant is challenging. A device that size, how do you get it in? And so he's come up with a way of basically attaching the probe via glucose insert this thing in a very controlled manner so we can measure the force and control the timing and everything to make it what we want based on the literature. And then we can, once it's in, you can dissolve the glucose in a saline and then remove the probe and you're left with just the inserted device. And so that works actually very, very well. We intentionally leave this up because the literature says if I stick a stiff device in there and don't anchor it, it'll float around the brain and you don't have nearly as much of a response. But if I'm going to be connecting wires and things to it, I want to know what the tethered version of this is. So we leave this little tab up and then we uh, actually embed that in a um, Quicksil or, you know, or dental cement or whatever it is we're closing this thing up with. So that's the general process. We leave this for a period of time, come back, section the brain, and take a look at the histology based on GFAP and different markers of the astrocytes, the microglia, activated microglia, et cetera. So Jimmy's come up with this, um, this process of taking an image. So this would be, this one in particular is GFAP. So you can see the cellular star-like cells for the astrocytes. And you see them throughout. And what you'll do is you'll take at the very distance, which is several hundred microns away, should be outside of the influence of this, take a background line to get a normalization value, and then take 100 different radial points out from the edge. So basically everything's normalized by distance from the discernible edge of the probe. And then take a reading of the intensity of each of these measurements going away from the probe normalized to to this background. And that tends to get rid of overexposure, underexposure, um, uh, different photo bleaching and everything else that we've been doing. So it's been a pretty robust way of doing it, or seems to be so far. 
So what we see is uh, in this original study, we looked at four and eight weeks. Uh, if I look at the uh, top is the response from a, a PVAC nanocomposite. At four weeks, the red are astrocytes that are in there, and the green essentially is the neuronal nuclei, so how close are we uh, with the neurons? And this is the uh, PVAC, the nanocomposite. This is the wire itself. And this is the response doing the measurement that Jimmy did the analysis. Basically, what you can see, this is the 50 microns I put it in here to kind of indicate our goal distance to have you know, neurons within that level. And at four weeks, there's not much difference between the neuronal nuclei, um, maybe just a slight bit right here, where the wire is slightly less than nanocomposite, but doesn't show up very much at that point. Inflammatory cells, uh, I think this one was stained for the, uh, I don't know, was this astrocytes or this the IBA? So that's activated microglia. Um, no, that's just microglia as a whole, right? Yeah. So this is all microglia in that region. So there's not much difference here at four weeks. The same thing with the inflammatory cells at eight weeks, but we start to see by eight weeks a little bit of a difference, and that'll be important in a second set of data. Uh, so we're seeing uh, the nanocomposite having potentially more neural nuclei in the region of that electrode, which is to what we're, we're getting at. The other thing that's interesting, though, is that this response here, remember I said that the mechanics are a distance effect in hypothet and our hypothesis is they occur more over a distance. So I'm always going to have the surface characteristics. We haven't solved that yet. We haven't even tried to address it. But mechanically, it's this distance part where I'm going to have the sensing at a distance. And so we're seeing separation once you get out here past the 50 where, in fact, the nanocomposite tends to come down more quickly and not have as much of an extended response, at least in this case was what we looked at. We were wondering about this. And the problem here is we had um, Teflon coated versus uh, the wires themselves. And so we did a matched surface chemistry. We took the poly, a PVAC, put that on a, on a probe. So rather than doing a Teflon coated probe, we po coated that with the PVAC and stuck the PVAC probe as a whole and then the coating in. And we looked at these. And the reason I point out the four week difference is we're only at four weeks here. Uh, and we're, we're working on the eight week trial. We don't have the data for that necessarily yet. But if you look at a whole host of things, the nice thing, the only one that's not showing a whole lot of difference is the one we want, which is the neuronal nuclei. But from earlier data, we suspect that's an eight-week issue before it really starts to show up. But everything else, the activated macrophages, so this is the, the, the microglia that are actually activated in the phag phagocytotic version, significantly lower on the nanocomposite. The, um, these are extracellular matrices um, elements, so it's laying down extracellular matrices lower on the nanocomposite, which should relate to the mechanics, right? Because as you're, as you're activating the system, it's going to upregulate the, this matrix generation. Astrocytes, again, maybe initially we're getting something which is interesting, but it, it drops off quickly and then lower than the wire. So in all these measurements, we seem to be getting a better response in the, in the softer material, effectively. And then we're waiting to see on the eight week what happens here. So encouraging. We did do a study, um, and we're looking through the PDMS. So now we have that really soft PDMS system. I think a, an advance here, two of them, was how do we make these? So this is the nanocomposite version of the probe and the shape. Again, the whole team came together to build the material, build the shape, and Jimmy came up with a way to insert these super soft devices. Uh, what you say defeats the whole process, and I'll talk to you about that later, because if I ever want to connect leads, I can't insert this way. But for testing out the mechanics, I can do it. So he's got a, a way of inserting these, even if they're at 100 kilopascal, put them in there. It looks great. And unfortunately, we're just in preliminary data, and we don't see much difference, which kind of is against the hypothesis. But these are very low, yeah. Okay. Uh, X-axis here. The zero is where? Is that the surface? No. no, I'm sorry. This is at the edge of the probe. It's not at center. It's at the actual edge. So each of those radial lines starting at the, at the end of the hole. So it's distance from the probe. Okay. So we, this is, again, early results of where we're going. I would have expected to see the 50 to 1, which is the softer material, so much less cross-linker, lower. And I, I think we need to work on degassing this as another materials issue or um, uh, leaching it. So I think that our cross-linker, we're having unreacted monomer in there, potentially. This is one of our hypotheses right now. So we're still looking at this. But the, the most interesting thing is we have a way of inserting these really soft probes and can do this with PDMS. If I look at them all together, maybe even PDMS as a whole isn't the best thing because a normally mixed one is still a higher reaction than what we have with the nanocomposite. So we're putting all this data together, and I think this is coming nicely, at least looking at the mechanics and where to go from here. We did some pilot work, again, uh, with, the micro, uh, with the MEMS group and the electronics group. They've coated these with gold. Uh, we've been able to stick them into a cockroach brain, admittedly a simple system, but nonetheless we can get active recording. So again, the group's moving all forward in that. I'm hoping we can get there pretty soon. I'm going to skip peripheral for the state of time. We are looking at um, 
you know, we, the state of the art basically, people are trying to get with the Utah slant array and the different penetrating devices trying to get into peripheral nerve. Again, there's a mechanical mismatch long term. If the nerve is constantly moving, there's, I, I, the hypothesis is that's going to make a difference. So we're looking at ways to potentially get these devices in. So this is Smrutha Kopaka. Uh, she's been looking at trying to insert these devices into peripheral nerves, and that's about all we have right now. So she's moving forward on that. So let me finish by looking at some of the long-term things, go back to, so that's, that's the mechanics we've done, the nanocomposite using the macro, or the nanoscale development to come up with solutions to the problems we had. Um, surface development, this is Jeff Capadona's work, uh, looking at not having releasable, necessarily releasable uh, glucocort, you know, steroids and things like that, but how do I anchor something that's gonna interact with the cellular integrins. So when it connects, I don't release the alpha MSH, but in fact that down regulates the signals that the cells themselves are doing. So it's not a releasing approach, it's a long-term management by acting with the cells at the surface. Um, or combining that where I do have a release so I manage the short-term approach, but then long-term I have this left, so different things you're looking at. Things also to consider, right? So uh, when I start thinking of what's going on at the nanoscale, this is kind of now back to more of a broad broad idea of where nanoscale is going to end this with you, um, is that genetic modifications of channels. So I'm looking at the channels again, people that have engineered optical genes into the channels themselves. Uh, optical stimulation itself as an active group. Uh, we're working with them to see how you can stimulate the channels optically and make the nerves work optically. So again, getting out of the mindset of electron transfer and how do we do that? And it could be that the optical stimulation might be better for, you know, maybe I can pump a, pro, a polymer a different way, different thing. So I think the, the message I want you to get out of this next little section is you gotta think outside the box potentially here and I think that's what makes this kind of fun. Challenging and in innovations, things to think about where innovation is needed. Biology is dynamic and abiotic is static, right? Biology is constantly renewing itself where devices we build, if we're not constantly rebuilding them, tend to degrade over time. And so this idea of biology being dynamic and the abiotic being static, I think is an interesting game. We start getting to the actual cellular level where there's turnovers quite a bit. Mechanics, in, we need to implant it, still be soft. And ultimately that relates to the 20 year problem. If I have a very, if I put jello in the body, I need 20 years of stable jello or re regenerating jello. That's not trivial, I don't think. If I can connect to a thousand axons, how am I gonna connect to a thousand axons, right? How am I gonna utilize this information? If I connect to a thousand axons and get that information out, the heck am I gonna do with it, right? I'm not gonna give the patient or the, the user a thousand pieces of data and try them trying to figure it out. So now I need algorithms to deal with it. <laughs> Don will, right here. So if I can get a thousand out and a thousand in, we're in good shape, <laughs> right? So the complexity, both of the temporal characteristics of that as well as the spatial characteristics and just the numbers, the surface chemistry issues, the information transfer, the long-term stability of that, um, the abiotic, reliability, style, I mean, lines break over time. If we're getting the nano scale, it's not like I have a wire that's big enough to basically safety factors of years. I have a couple molecules, I have a couple layers thick. Can I make that work and be, be comfortable with that? And that's the problem with like the um, conductive polymers. Over time, as you keep pushing current through them, they tend to degrade. So that's a problem. Um, and that relates to this conversion of chemical energy. Maybe I can do that differently. So we talked about the optical or different ways. Maybe I could pull sodium into, you know, if I can build a polymer system where sodium is typically in there until I push a current down the polymer and it dumps the sodium back out. And so rather than electron transfer the, uh, the bilayer, maybe I can come up with a polymer system that behaves differently. Um, bandwidth, these are all issues of the user capabilities and stuff we talked about. The other side is we just need new tools to be able to get down there, right? The fabrication of devices. I think it's kept uh, you know, Jeremy and Allison and Chris pretty busy just to make with what we have, but if I keep getting lower and lower in the connections, how am I gonna do this macro scale to nano scale conversion? How am I gonna go from a molecule to a system that's uh, connected? So I think there's a lot of development work and tools to be there. These are the other two that I'm very interested in, I think that people need to think about, is how to do the accelerated models to show that a device is gonna last 20 years, right? I can't do safety factors as well and I can't heat up a rat and see what happens in the Arrhenius relationship. <laughs> so the idea is if I need a device that's gonna last 20 years, how am I gonna test that unless I set it for 20 years, so the, the tools. The other thing is high throughput tools. So we're talking these channels and these pathways, they're very complex. How do I study them without killing, you know, without working through a whole bunch of animals? And that's, you know, we want to reduce, reuse, and follow those techniques. And so we need to figure ways that we can get the answers 
quicker and more efficiently. So I think tools to do that is important. And one of the things too is real-time methodologies. Everything we do is end time points and we correlate all this. Can I view in real time what's going on at the surface? So there's some work with the uh, molecular guys, molecular imaging, that can maybe see what's happening with these molecules in real time on the probe surface as opposed to taking these static snapshots and trying to build the picture around it. So the things in that. Uh, anything we can do in vivo to measure that uh, signaling and, and cellular response. Anything in in vitro that matches the in vivo. Obviously one cell type in vitro doesn't make the brain, so. Um, sustainability of the interface, we talked a lot about this, the drug release long term, I don't, I'm not going to go back over it. The ideas of maybe catalytic, catalytic surfaces, so rather than releasing or causing something or releasing a material or adding things to the environment, we're sitting in the middle of a very nice chemical environment. So maybe we think about how do I promote the chemistry that I want based on the catalytic connections I put on the surface if I build catalysts into my device. So I'm not consuming what I have, but I'm promoting what needs to go already in the body. Um, so different ideas like that. Reloadable surfaces, so once I consume, I can refill it, and then the integrating actions with the cell. Self-repair. Um, and I'll just finish with, uh, these are a couple other points, but I think from a time perspective, you know, just some things I've kind of hit on already, these ideas of bio-inspired, complex, self-powered. So I want to touch, I will touch on this, right? I said earlier, you can't get into the brain without damaging blood vessels. That's an in-the-box thought. The outside the box would say the bodies, the things in the body are moving around there all the time. So if I'm engineering on the macro scale, molecular scale, can I engineer molecular motors that I can utilize to move around in there like the, the body does? And I think that's, it's out there, but I think it's possible. I think people have built things that are possibly usable there. Um, so self-powered, I mean, the energy's in there. How do I use it? <coughs> Novel charge conversion. And all this kind of stuff, I mean, it's a multidisciplinary activity to make all this happen, ultimately. You need the biomedical engineer. You need the neuroscientists. You need the macromolecular people. You need the electrical engineering, all these people together. So this isn't a solution. You know, like clinical problems aren't something solved by a single person. I don't think the nanoscale interface is either. And ultimately, from my perspective, I can't translate it. It's not useful. So we got to keep that in mind as well, is how am I going to put this into people eventually? And that's, there's a lot of things that come along with that that becomes tricky. And this is one, too, to think about. If I'm going to have a device tightly integrated into the body and it fails, what do I do? Can I pull it out, get it out? What do, you know, is that possible down the road to deal with that? These are the original three points. Lots of people. Probably not all of them listed there. If I forgot, I'm sorry. I appreciate your attention, and I'll take any questions. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering, and even on the short term, since you have this very flexible electrode attached to a fixed point, and what I've seen when during brain operations, the brain actually pulsates. You get a lot of shearing just in that short period of time between your wet and wet. In terms of at the, between the material and the brain itself? No, between yeah. the, the, this flexible electrode and the fixed point on the skull. Mm -hmm. During the surgery, it's open. Right? So it goes in, release it, takes a bit of time. So this pulsating is still moving along with it. It's after you close up and get the seal on there that, that you'll have that relative motion. Um, and we don't see that. I mean, I'm not physically looking at it, but I'm sure there's the motion in there. The, the, the rat is also kind of one of the easier situations for us, right? Because it's a pretty tight um, brain case in there. So it's not, say, like the, the non-human primate or the, you know, the, the human primate, <laughs> which there's a lot of motion in there. So uh, I don't have a quantified. There's some modeling work that's been done at the University of Michigan that kind of tries to quantify the motion in the top versus what actually is translated to the tip of the probe, for example, versus the surface, which are probably the two most mechanically disadvantaged points, right? So if I'm pushing, it's right at the surface where there's kind of a fulcrum in the brain, especially if I have a stiff device, and then it's going to be down at the tip where you've got the maximum kind of moment arm in there. So there's some modeling work, but I don't know of anybody that's measured that directly. So, so when you put an electrode in the brain, there's a reaction you describe that in detail. So there are many things that happen, something to do with the surface, uh, inflammation, mechanical properties, but you, you address the mechanical aspect so what do you think the percentage of the problem is attributable to the mechanical properties as opposed to the mechanical? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I think what we're trying to get at, um, I'm trying to get the answer to that. I don't know the answer. Um, where we're at right now is it appears, kind of at least in the data we have so far, is that it appears that our responses differ most significantly when you get past maybe about 50 microns or so. Um, whether that's then, so there's actually a nice study that I want to do. There's a, um, a spider venom 
that's been isolated from the tarantula. It's very specific to the mechanical sensitive channels. And so it, it, it's it, calcium, current, mechanical sensitive channels are blocked exclusively from this, from this drug. And so I think from that we can start doing some of these studies to tease out the mechanics versus the surface. Um, the other way we're doing it is, is basically having these surface matched materials and trying to see what the difference between the two of them is. Um, I'm trying to think if uh, there's a specific study that's looked at or has given that answer and I'm unaware of it that knows specifically the distance. But uh, the, the work that's been done before with the silicon probe says that the response is about 160 to 300 microns in general for those probes, but they never divided between the two. So I think the other side I'll say is that um, so we're pretty early, the answer is not known, but the other thing that people have looked at is the thickness of that surface layer for the cells to be able to sense the surface, and then there's the surface of the material versus the underlying substrate. And you have to be about 70 uh, nanometers, I think, or more. So if, if it's less than 70 nanometers, the cells will actually sense whatever substrate this surface is on. So if you have a soft gel on top of something underneath it, they'll sense it if it's less than 70 nanometers. But the actual extent of the surface characteristics versus the, the uh, mechanical, I don't know. But let me, so, so just sort of practical issues, how do you sterilize this material and, you know, with the, you know, once you've put a you know, conductor, what's the impedance of this look like? Impedance, uh, one of the problems with this material set is, in, is impedance, I think we're in the, and I can't remember the number, you can help me out if you remember, Jimmy, it's in the, um, I think we're in the, the kilo ohms for the conductor and then mega ohms roughly across the material itself. So the problem with this mechanism is the material sucks up water. I mean, that's the mechanism changing. So it itself is not uh, insulating. And so one of the things we're working on different processing techniques is putting a very thin um, atom level of perylene, you know, vapor deposition perylene in there to do the insulation but not mess up the mechanics and then, and then look at the um, use the substrate as the support. So I don't have, I mean, we have the preliminary data, we've actually measured the substrate itself and we're in the mega ohms and then we put, we've actually done carbon wire traces, you know, carbon filament traces and we put some coating on there and they vary. But one to two orders of magnitude difference between the material itself and the, and the probe. Not good enough really to use long term, especially for recording I don't think, but there's a difference. Um, and your first question was sterilization. What do you do, Jimmy? Yeah. I'm sorry. Just put it in the auto bit. It gets really hot. So it, it it's, it's basically right in the, like under the safety margin of the cellulose fiber breakdown. So hmm. so far we haven't had a problem with that. We changed to a different substrate. That's something we'll have to factor into. We also I mean we've done the measurement post autoclaving and it doesn't change the mechanics significantly. Maybe I think in um, five to two or something like that. But I mean, we've done the post autoclaving measurement of the mechanics and they're still similar. So these results are related to that. So my, my, can I just ask another question? That, so that's sort of totally different. Maybe it's, you know, sort of Dawn, Dustin kind of question. Yeah, so my, my impression has been that, you know, because of the, you know, the tissue response like you showed in the, you know, which I know very little about, about you know, from these brain probes, that, that what must be being recorded must be at the tips because that's where you get neurons that are, you know, sort of close enough in the in the region. So I don't know whether that's is that would that be true or or you know is it just my incorrect operating hypothesis? You know, because it really has to do with sort of my next question as well. You know, is it is, is you know where where would these where would you expect these? You know, when you have the uh, you know the the former cyberkinetics Utah probe in human brains, what cells would be close enough to be able to record from, well, they must be at the tips, not the shafts, right? Right. Um, initially, probes still have, uh, the silicon probes, they can have a convex along the tip, so Right, but I mean the, these, these, the Utah probes. Right, and micro wires as well, the contacts are at the tips. Yeah. There are contacts elsewhere, so that's where they have to be. I think, I think the answer, too, depends who you ask a little bit. If you ask Pat Tresco, he'd say you're not going to get anything near it if you have this big plane. So you're going to get this buildup of, of um, 
chemicals and, and signaling molecules on the surface of this plane, and that's going to cause the neurons to not be there. In fact, the interesting thing is if you look at, uh, if you go back, well, it'll be a little ways up here, but the early one, if you look at that response uh, that I showed for the Michigan probe, wrong, uh, <laughs> sorry. Almost there. If you look at this, um, although it's not as clear here, <laughs> I think there'd be some, some people would argue that in fact it's because of the broad surface here you get kind of this build up here and then it kind of is smaller on the side. And so that's one of the reasons that um, Pat Tresco really um, promotes the idea of open space, broad space in the electrode array, so you have this flow, you don't have build up materials and impedance, um, and these kind of designs where you get this flow through probe and stuff. Uh, you know, I don't know that it's proven for sure, but that's kind of the, the, the kind of running theory right now, but I don't think the answer is known for sure. And, and so he would say that's why you can't record here, you have to put it out on the end. And even Michigan is, is working on putting these in these little outrigger areas. So it's again, it's a size issue. I'm not sure if it's a size or a response issue, ultimately, you know. Um, because the neurons are responsive to both. It's the same thing separating the question that Dr. Duran asked was, is it mechanics or surface? I don't think anybody knows for sure. So going through doing the studies, I mean, that's the, the work is to figure out which one we need to separate and how we need to go about doing that. So, okay, so I'm not sure what the follow-on question would be, actually, because I've got to get it straight in my head. But so, so can, you, can you put this, you, you, you know, put a slide up there that was optical and you know, sort of last couple of weeks, right? Cle uh, Clemens Berta and Ben Strobridge, you yes. know, presented that, you know, had the, had the work about the uh, optical. Right. Well, they had, can you, Vanderbilt's done a lot of work in that too. For yeah, right. You know, can, so can you put this into this approach into perspective? And, you know, are we, uh, you know, sort of really, you know, pushing so much uphill with, you know, sort of being still thinking of, you know, the, you know, electrons uh, transfer, you know, one way or another, or you know, just put it into perspective. I, I'll put it into an opinion, <laughs> kind of. Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, maybe that's what perspective means. Um, I don't, the Strobridge work and stuff, I mean, if they had a, they had a primer in there, an optically sensitive released molecule, right? So it was activated by light, clearly activating the channel. So that's, I think that, the problem you're still going to have with that is how are you going to keep the molecule active, you know, optically active in that area, and then you're going to have the issue of delivering light, and I don't know how you're going to do that. I don't know the polymers that can do that. Just it's not my field. I don't know they can't be. I just don't know how to do it. Um, the issue with Vanderbilt is they don't really know why it stimulates, frankly, from what I can tell. They're pretty sure it's a temperature difference, um, and I've started to do some modeling with that to see if that alone, say, with the Nernst potentials and the changes in the Arrhenius relationships, can fire an action potential based on heat alone, and they do, but unfortunately I need about an order of magnitude too much temperature change to make it happen. I mean, there's some interesting things there I started to play with. Does that being a safety issue then, or what? Yeah, that well that's ultimately, and, and, and so the competing hypothesis with the optical stuff, especially with the heat, is that you're actually denaturing some proteins, you're causing chemical reactions that in fact that's what the channel's activated on. They're pretty confident with you know, Duco Jansen and, and John Wells and the group at, at Vanderbilt's pretty sure it's heat alone. They've done some other studies that they're pretty confident it's heat. <coughs> Models maybe, but I haven't done enough to say that. So I think there's an awful lot to learn yet in the optical. I think, the, I think we know how to deliver electrons in various manners. We know how to, I got more work to do. Um, we know how to, to, to deliver electrons there. But I don't, I don't know how to deliver the light. And I think we're still going to have the same problems. And, and the other thing you run into is electrons I can deliver down a, um, down a, um, a metal line. Right? I mean, we've worked on this a long time. And, and one of the other problems we run into with active circuitry, so other people are looking at ways of optically communicating to an electrode, for example, solving the wire problem by sending information optically. The problem is then you have to have some active circuitry down there to deal with the optics. And I can't hermetically seal it yet. I mean, ultimately, there's, there's the other which is fundamentally a nanoscale problem 
on the macro scale stuff is then you have micro cracks or these nano cracks in, in the materials that they give out over time or I have fluid getting through there. So we have the issue of delivering the optics or generating the optics down there. So I think there's a lot of challenges to be solved there. I can push an electron. I think the bigger, my concern more so is how do I get an electron reliably down through a very, very small metal wire? How do I create the small metal wire in the first place that's reliable with a high yield? And then 20 years of, you know, little kind of motion. There's been some interesting work that um, along those lines that uh, Barclay Morrison at Columbia and his colleagues are doing where they're laying very thin gold on, on PDMS. And it turns out because of the macroscopic or nanoscopic properties, you can take that and stretch it almost 200% and it still conducts fine. So again, it, it's interesting that, you know, always your assumptions at the macro scale don't always hold at the, at the nano scale. And so I think there's a lot of, you know, fairly interesting work there that they've been doing and that needs to be looked at here as well. You know, he's, he's worked out some of the methods of attaching gold reliably to a PDMS substrate, I think, and they've been working on that for quite a while. So some, some interesting work going on in there. I, I don't know who will win. I think there's all have their challenges, right? And in, in the end, it's the short answer. The nice thing about optics is if it can, well, the crosstalk issues and potential. There's a lot of different things. You get down to that small scale. I'm not sure how to solve them. Maybe a nice topic for a neural interfaces conference. Would be an interesting topic for a neural interfaces conference. Would be an interesting topic for a, a large scale proposal. Yeah. Have you ever tried practical limitations as to how long you can make the electrode? Can you get a centimeter below the surface or any longer? There's always practical issues to that. Um, we're making them about three millimeters, two millimeters now for the rat. Um, one of the things we're running into, I mean, to get them into the cortex now, you have to, um, we have to cut the dura. I mean, you have to make a dural window. And that's really the problem we're running into in the peripheral nerve is we're trying not to cut the perineurium. It has about the same mechanical properties. So we find there, the problem is it goes in, and although it won't buckle to a certain range, if it does buckle, it tends to snap. And so the longer you make that probe, the more it's likely to snap. And you know, then you have to come up with a way of pushing but holding it at the edge. So obviously size is gonna have an issue from that perspective, just the pure mechanics of it. We make them two and they go in fairly well now under this controlled insertion. I don't know, is that, what's the longest you've made? You know, uh, are you used to a nano composite one? Yeah. A two millimeter shaft. So that's where we're at beyond that. There'll be mechanical stuff. It's always, it's a, I mean, it's a beam problem in that way too. If you go deeper, you can change the cross-sectional that in a moment of inertia basically or the, you know, the change of the cross-sectional shape and, and kind of take the load, the different load that it can take on. So, I mean, you can make it bigger and go deeper or you know, take more of a load, but that's the engineering design challenge I think we've faced there. Good, thank you very much.